good to be back with you this morning. Uh, again, for those of you that are just uh, coming in, my name is Scott Sittig, and uh, just welcome to New Hope this morning. It's good to see everybody, and uh, looking forward to being together with you all week long. So it's so, so good when I stand up here and during the week and those seats are empty. Uh, I pray for you guys, and I pray for today. So you're sitting in seats that have been prayed for. Uh, you have been prayed for amongst many different people in the life of our church, and uh, I don't believe that it's any accident that you are here this morning. And so welcome. It is good to have you here with us today. Uh, according to George Barna, uh, his research, he says that uh, 73% of Americans uh, consider themselves as Christians. Okay, 73%. Yet, uh, if you were to really unpack that, what he would define as a Christian is somebody who attends church at least one time per month, and they say that faith or religion is really important to them. So that's the bar these days. That's the bar for what it means to be a Christian, that you attend at least once, and you say it's really important to you. However, when you actually dig a little bit deeper and you actually get under the surface and you say, how many of those people actually pray? How many of those people actually read their Bible or do some other sort of uh, spiritual discipline like meditation or something like that? Uh, the number goes down significantly. So much so that in terms of that 73% who call themselves Christians, probably about 31% are what we would call practicing Christians. Uh, it's become so prevalent today that he actually me measures how many people he would say are actually non-practicing, which is that other number, 41%. Um, but our culture has become most, almost predominantly post-Christian. 48% of Americans would kind of count into this category of non-practicing post-Christian, even though they might identify themselves as Christian. I mention that to you to say, uh, why is that important? Why does that question come up? Because there's a lot of people today asking the question, why do I need church? Anybody ever heard that question before? Why do I come on Sunday? None of I got one. <laughs> all right, yeah, this is, this is interactive for a couple of minutes. All right, I know you got to sit there for a while, but if I ask a question, you can respond. This is a small church. We're good that way, all right? So how many of you have heard that question? Why do I need church, right? It's a significant question people are wrestling with out there. I think it's most prevalent, and we hear a lot about it among uh, what we might call the generation millennials, right? They're some of the most skeptical. They're the younger generation uh, out there, and uh, they're probably some of the most skeptical about church, about faith, and about religion and Christianity. But not just the millennials, right? Uh, we've got baby boomers still around. They, they question sometimes the church, and we've got Gen X, and we've got Gen Y, and we've got all kinds of people who are really wondering, what difference does church make? Why do I need to come to church? Why is it so important today? You know why? Because we don't necessarily see how church fits with our life. Oh, we come to church on Sunday, and many of us who've been coming to church for a while, we're, we're more loyal than the most, right? We come to church every Sunday, and, and we do our church routine, right? And we may even connect with some people, and, and it sort of recharges us, and that's a good thing, right? And we might get a few to-dos, and, and uh, pastor, we, you might give a few points that you're like, oh yeah, I should go work on that, and, and you're good, right? And you sort of get this energy, and then... You walk out and you go to a world where last Sunday somebody walks into a church not dissimilar from this one and murders 26 people. And if you're like me, you're like, how? That could have been us. And then throughout the course of the week, of course, we're learning more and more, and throughout the course of the week, we, we hear other things, right? We hear inflammatory comments from our elected officials, and we hear more and more about allegations of sexual misconduct in, in Hollywood and politics. It seems like everybody's got some issue, and please don't show me any more pictures of Harvey Weinstein, all right? Anybody relate? Like, the news is overwhelming, 
The issues in our world are overwhelming, and yet we keep coming to church and wondering, why isn't the church making more of an impact in the world around us? What difference does my faith, what difference does my church make? And it's a profound question, and honestly, it's the question that we have been wrestling with, even though I might not have been very clear as we've gone through this, but it's the essence of why we're in this series. The series is called God With Us, and we have been looking at different ideas for why the church actually matters, but the kingdom of God has come. We believe that. The kingdom of God has come, and that means Jesus Christ is at work here and now, and he chooses to use you and I. And so if we're going to make a difference in the world, we have to understand how the difference starts with us. That's the essence of why we're studying this particular series called God With Us. We have to understand how God wants to use us in order to see how we, the church, are supposed to make the difference in the world. And we've been looking at that through various lenses called disciplines. The different disciplines we've studied so far are trying to understand the Lord's Supper, communion. We looked, we dove deep down into the idea of communion and what it means and how it shapes us. Right? And then we, we looked at the idea of reconciliation. How do we get along with one another? How do we overcome those barriers that exist between you and I and the diversity and the differences that we have in the world? And, and not just our big differences, but sometimes those interpersonal differences. And we studied and we looked at reconciliation. And then we went into the idea of being with the littlest ones, right? And then we talked about being with the least of these and how all of these practices are disciplines that shape us to be on mission in the world so that our church and the global church does not seem so ineffective, does not seem so impotent, but these disciplines, they shape us for ministry and mission in the world. And we talked about proclaiming the gospel, and how the gospel is not just a matter of personal salvation, but it's a matter of cosmic redemption of creation, right? And, and God's big picture for what he was trying to do and what he ultimately will accomplish, right? So we've looked at all of these things, and we're going to pick up with another one of those disciplines. But understand the importance of the question, why church? Why do I need the church? Because Jesus Christ chose the church. And you and I have the opportunity to be a part of that mission, to be a part of that project, that service, that ministry, that global endeavor he calls the kingdom of God that is supposed to make a difference in the world that you and I live in. That's why we're studying this, right? So, so if I want to lose 20 pounds, which I do, right? And I continue to eat the way I keep eating, which I do, and I don't exercise, which I actually have started. Do you think I'm going to lose my 20 pounds? Sort of, maybe over time, right? But I got to get the eating thing, right, Cheryl? I got to get the eating thing down. It's the same thing with these spiritual disciplines, these disciplines that shape the church. I can't just want them. I have to be shaped by them. And if I'm shaped by them, then the disciplines begin to manifest themselves in the world. Through Christ's presence in the world, things will change. Amen? So that's what we're looking at today is we're going to pick up with that next um, topic. And the topic for today is looking at what we would call the five-fold ministry. And I've called it reframing uh, spiritual leadership, understanding how God uses spiritual gifts to lead his church. And we're going to study that through the lens of Ephesians. So uh, if you'd like to, you can turn there with me. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, if you've got a phone, you've got some electronic device, or if you have uh, actual pen uh, on paper here or ink on pages, you can turn there as well. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, if you look in the Bible, it's pretty much all the way to the end and then flip back a couple. All right? So Ephesians chapter 4. And before I get there, you guys can get there. I'd like you to think about this particular thought. Healthy churches grow. Amen? Healthy churches grow, and the master gardener is Jesus. Jesus. All right? So healthy churches grow. The master gardener is Jesus. What fertilizer does he use? 
The fertilizer that he uses are the gifts, the spiritual gifts that he gives to each of us. All right, so you've got Jesus, the master gardener, using the fertilizer to help grow the church. And then this is our thought for today. The church will grow only when God's gifts are on full display. Amen? So that's what we're going to unpack today. The church will only grow when God's gifts are on full display. No one person has all the gifts. Say amen. amen. Say it louder. No one person has all the gifts. Amen. That is the truth, right? And so what we're going to learn today is how God uses all of us with spiritual gifts. Gifts are shared. Gifts are shared. And they're only affirmed and used. And only when they're affirmed and used will we totally understand the mind of Christ. It takes all of us to come to a complete understanding of the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 So, you can think about it this way. You've been given a gift. Say, I've been given a gift. gift. Okay, look at your neighbor and tell them, you've been given a gift. (laughs) All right, that's, okay, the other way. Look the other way if you didn't have a neighbor. You've been given a gift. That's what we're talking about today. We All have been given spiritual gifts, and it requires all of us to understand what that means in order for the church to achieve its mission in the world. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read from uh, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And uh, when you got it, somebody say go. All right, somebody's got it. Let's go. Now these are the gifts Christ gives to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children, We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Amen. So let me just give you a little bit of context. This is a letter to the Ephesians. Uh, Paul went and visited the Ephesians on one of his missionary journeys, and now, years later, this is approximately in 62 AD, uh, years later, Paul is now reflecting on his missionary journey. He's reflecting on where they are in the life of their growth as Christians and the growth of this young, fledgling church, and he's now writing a letter back to them. He is probably in prison as he writes this in Rome. He was taken prisoner, taken captive on one of uh, his last journeys, and now he's reflecting and he's writing and he's sharing his thoughts. He gets to penning this letter in the Ephesians, and he gets to this, what we call chapter 4, and we start to hear his heart about the church. His heart is the similar to Jesus who in John chapter 17 prayed a prayer for the people that would follow what he would call his church. And he says, I pray that they may be one as you and I are one. And he goes on to pray this great prayer of unity for his church as modeled by himself, Jesus, and God together, the Father, and ultimately one with the Holy Spirit. As we are one, I pray that they may be one And why? So that the rest of the world can understand the uniqueness of who we are. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, the context is this idea of spiritual unity because, and we get this sort of by fact, if you go back to the early verses of chapter 4, but also by, uh, there's something implied here, that there was some disunity. Anybody ever experienced church disunity? Things kind of break down a little bit, right? And and Paul is kind of addressing this idea of some disunity that's creeping up into the body. And some people are having struggles with other people. And and Paul's like, you know what? Be patient with one another. Bear with one another. 
Like, this is, this is tough stuff, right? And we're learning more about each other and we're struggling through this, but, but bear with one another because this is all part of God's bigger plan and purpose and you guys are all on this mission together. It's not about any one of you individually. It's about all of us together on mission and we need each other. We all need each other, and he would write about that in another letter to a group of people he called the Corinthians, or that were known as the Corinthians. He would write about that, and he would say that, you know, uh, no one person is above anybody else. There's no gift that isn't necessary here. Uh, so we all need to be working together. But that's the context for these particular verses, and then he gets to telling us who these uh, what these gifts kind of look like, all right? This is not the only place in the New Testament where gifts are talked about. Uh, spiritual gifts are talked about, if you want to write this down. And, and inside your bulletin, there is something, uh, a sermon note thing. You can take some notes on it if you'd like. But other parts of Scripture talk about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14 talk about spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts. Uh, 1 Peter 4 talks about spiritual gifts, and we're talking about it from Ephesians chapter 4, all right? Um, except for 1 Peter, uh, the various gifts and offices that Paul describes were kind of written by him at different points in his journey, and as he begins to see how the Holy Spirit is manifesting uh, himself through the life of the early church, he begins to see different offices and ways. But these five have kind of become the core uh, for church and, and kind of understanding the big offices of the spiritual gifts that are given. And so let's just look at a few of them. Uh, let's look at the five that are listed here. We'll talk about apostles, uh, just so you can kind of get an understanding. I'm not going to dive deep into what the spiritual gifts are. I'm just going to give you kind of an overview, because the point today is not so much what the spiritual gifts are. The point is, why are they important for the life of the church? As I said earlier, they all have to be on display for our church to grow and to be healthy and to become a life-giving, impactful church in our communities. And so I'm not necessarily going to dive deep. There's a lot of resources out there, and we could go deeper, and if you want to know more, come talk to me. But today we're just going to hit the high points. So apostles, they initiate, they gather, they pioneer new works. And now you could unpack this a little bit further and and is it an office of status or is it an office of function and there's some debate out there among in christian circles and you can go to a variety of different churches and they're going to interpret the word apostle in a variety of different ways and again i'm not going to get into the to the meat of all of that the the word apostle in its truest form is one who is sent all right a person who is sent is somebody who is there to tell the good news of jesus christ right to, to tell what they've seen, to experience what they've seen. And apostles uniquely oftentimes have this gift of being able to start new things, share some good words to start new things. They rally people around them. That might be you this morning. That might be something that you have noticed about yourself. People like to follow you. People are interested in what you have to say. People are uh, following along on your words and your actions, and they're, they're paying attention to you. That might be something that that you need to pay a little bit more attention to. What, is, what does that gift look like for you? Second one up there is prophets. If there's one gift that probably makes us the most uncomfortable, it's the gift of prophecy, right? Because when we read this in our modern context, we often think of prophecy as somebody who foretells the future. And in most instances in Scripture, that is not the concept of what prophecy means. There were prophets, and there were prophets that told the future by God's ordination in the Old Testament in particular, kind of telling of the good news of Jesus, and even some speaking like Daniel all the way to the end of time. And even in the New Testament, John had his revelation. And, and so we do know that prophecy can contain elements of future telling, but most of the time, the gift the spiritual gift of prophecy is about telling the truth. It's being able to see something that other people don't see and being able to call it out for what it is. So they, re they reveal truth and, and the call of God into situations, especially in issues of justice and neglecting the poor. And so that's the idea of, is that something that burns within you? When you think about the gift of prophecy, do you find yourself kind of standing up, rallying for the causes of the poor and the, the unjust and those sorts of things, then you might have uh, a stirring from the Holy Spirit in this area, this giftedness of prophecy. 
And it's also one that we have to be aware of because if we see it in somebody else, it's there for a purpose. It might not be our strength, and it might make us really uncomfortable because when people speak the truth, how many of you like to hear it? I hear the giggles. Nobody really likes to be put on the spot, right? And as a church, sometimes we hear people speaking the truth to us. I can tell you as the pastor of this church for a very short period of time, relatively, a lot of people speak truth into my life. A lot of you speak truth into my life. And I am not saying that as tongue-in-cheek. The reality is I have to listen to that. It's uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable, but in humility, I have to listen and discern. Was that from the Lord, or is that just somebody with something they've got to get off their mind, right? But a lot of times, what I've learned is that God uses you to hold me accountable. God uses you to challenge me, and by God's grace, I believe we're better for it. So I know full well it makes me uncomfortable, and I think in some ways, that may be what Paul's talking about in the early part of chapter 4 where there's, he's talking about bear with one another, be patient with one another because some people try to exercise their gifts and, and they're not quite refined at it, right? They, they don't know how to communicate and it just kind of and it just it's all over the place and there's truth in it but it might not have come out the right way so we be patient with one another we bear with one another, we love one another and ultimately it helps the body to grow and we'll get back to that then there are pastors. Pastors tend to and sustain people's souls. Those are the ones that come alongside of you in times of need. And even when there's not necessarily a crisis, they're helping you, they're pushing you, they're, they're encouraging you to think about things in your own life and how could life be different and what should I be thinking about. And pastors have that ability to be good listeners and to come alongside of you and encourage you. And some of you have that gift. You don't have to have the title or the office all the time you have the gift a pastoral gift where you can listen to people and help them and encourage them and and come alongside of them that might be speaking to some of you this morning then evangelists thank god for evangelists they're the ones who bring the good news especially to those who are hurting and some of us say i don't have the gift of evangelism and and what we don't realize is some of us have it but we don't exercise it all it really means is I want to share the good news of what God has done in my life. Now, we interpret it as I got to go stand on the street corner and yell it out to everybody so they can hear it. And yes, there are some people that do that freely and willingly, and that's wonderful. But a lot of times being an evangelist is just sitting down with somebody and expressing what God has done in my life and the difference that he's made and the difference that he's making in the world around us. And all of these interactions become evangelistic opportunities. So we don't have to necessarily feel like I, I can't share that. It, no, it's just relationally. Is it popping up? And some of you know that feeling. You have that gift. And I know some of you, it just flows really freely. And then there are others of you who, who do kind of like, ah, I don't know. That's all right. Some of you have that gift of evangelism. And then the last one he talks about here are teachers. They help. They explain they deepen people's faith. And we have some very gifted teachers among us. Some of them are small group leaders, and some of them are doing it vocationally. They're actually in schools and other places, and I know that you have the gift of being able to translate and make things personal and understandable, and that's really the gift of a teacher, is being able to bring all of that stuff out. So all of these gifts are a part of the ministry that God equips the church to accomplish in the world around us. And I, I would say that as the church matures, as any church matures, and this is Paul writing to the Ephesians now, that church was probably eight, ten years old. It's really in, an, in its infancy. As the church matures, these gifts become more manifest. And as they become more manifest, it creates a little bit of potential disunity because somebody starts looking at, oh, I wish I had that gift, right? And we start kind of comparing ourselves to one another and we don't feel as good. And, and then uh, sometimes people can made to, be made to feel inferior. Um, I don't, why don't I have more of these gifts? And, you know, there are some other gifts that aren't listed here. You could think of gifts like hospitality and administration and the gift of prayer. And these are all gifts that are listed in other parts of Scripture. And, and sometimes in our desire to compare ourselves to this, pri this primary list here, we compare ourselves to others, and that's not what it's about. 
everybody has a gift. Everybody's to use that gift. It says in, uh, over in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, it talks about the gifts. And uh, 12, 7, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says this, To each the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Everybody is given a spiritual gift for the common good. In 12, 11, it says, He gives them to each of us as He chooses. That's God. God gives through the Holy Spirit everybody a gift as he chooses. And it goes on in verse 21 to say that no one has the right to say that some gifts aren't needed. Nobody can stand in judgment against somebody else and say, you know what, we don't need that. You know what, quiet down, that prophecy isn't needed today, right? We don't need to talk about that truth today. Or, you know what, I don't need, pastor, I, I need something different today, right? Or, no, we don't need to start this new initiative, just quiet down and sit in your place. No, we don't do that. We share, we come together corporately, and that's why we have shared leadership and a shared leadership model. I said earlier, you've been given a gift, so the next idea is that you should what? Use it, right? We have spiritual gifts, and we need to use it. Look at your neighbor and say, use your gift. Use those gifts that you have been given. In the verses that we have here in Ephesians, why should we use those gifts? It says right there in uh, verse 12, their responsibility is to equip God's people. The responsibility of these gifts and the people that use them is to equip God's people to build up the church, the body of Christ, to do his work. That's the purpose of the spiritual gifts. It's not just to edify you. It's not just to make you feel good about yourself, right? How many are pretty content when we see something happening inside of us and we're like, yes, I got this, and, and we stop there. We get excited because that's a good thing, but we stop there. We forget, no, it's not about me. It's about using that gift for the edification and the building up of the church. That's why we exist. If we, as a church, continue every Sunday to just come here and be fed, we would call that what? Spiritual gluttony right? It's because I just keep eating, I keep eating, I keep eating, but I'm not actually doing anything with it. That's the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to reach those who are lost, to reach the unchurched, and yet how many times do we just come here because I've had a rough week and I just need to recharge? And that's a good thing, right? We do need that, but it doesn't stop there. The purpose of why we exist as a church is to reach those who aren't here. They need to hear that good news, some of them are afraid to walk into the doors of a church because of this disunity that Paul was writing to the Ephesians about. We can't even get along. We can't even agree. What's it mean to be an apostle? Just, we have all these internal debates and struggles and what's it mean to be saved and all of that stuff. And people are like, if you can't even get it together, why should I come in there? And that's what Paul's talking about. He's like, bear with one another. Be a model of unity for the rest of the world to see. Because as we are a witness to the rest of the world, people will want to know more about the story of the gospel. So, we've been given a gift. We need to definitely use it. Christ wants us to be interdependent with one another. He wants us to work together in love. And he wants us to grow together. There's this idea of, of incompleteness without all of these gifts. We need all the gifts working together to understand the mind of Christ. I can't have, like, I can't have my head telling my foot that I, I don't need you today, right? I can't walk around on one foot. And, and you know that analogy from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where the body starts to talk to itself and the body starts to tell different parts of the body that they're not necessary and that's his image for the church. We are one body. Can you imagine me walking around on one foot all day? I don't need you right foot today. You're good, right? And, and I can do this with one hand tied behind my back, so we're good today, right? That's not how it works. We all have spiritual gifts. They're all necessary. They're all important. And we've got to understand what they are. So you've been given a gift. You need to use it, but you need to also understand what it looks like. So let me shift gears really quickly to say, what does it look like here at New Hope? I'm just going to offer you a couple of ideas around that. Uh, we've been talking as a leadership team about the role of gender in leadership of the church, male and female leadership within the church. 
And I'm just going to say point blank to you today that the position of our church and my personal position is that God gifts men and women equally. Amen? Amen? There are gifts that he wants to be used in the life of his church, and he will use whoever is available to him, male or female. Amen. That could be all the way up to leadership, pastoral leadership in the church. It could be anything in between all those gifts, prophecy, teaching, evangelism, pastoring, apostleship, you name it. At New Hope, we believe that God gifts each person uniquely and individually, regardless of your gender. So I just want you to be aware of that. In the church, we also have, in this church, what we call an Episcopal way of church leadership. Now, what does that mean? It just means that we kind of have, we have bishops. We have a hierarchy. So within our church, sometimes there's this idea that hierarchy kind of forces leadership to the top. And when you see a hierarchy, you're conditioned in the world to think that that person then has the authority over the rest of the body. And that would be a true and accurate understanding of an Episcopal way of leadership. We have bishops, and they have ultimate authority and accountability. In our church, we end up in North America, we have three unique, huh, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, they don't claim that, right? They, they really don't. <laughs> but we do have three bishops because they consider themselves a shared leadership model. And I would submit to you today that even though we have bishops, we have superintendents, we have pastors, lead pastors, senior pastors, whatever you want to call it, the Free Methodist Church believes in servant leadership. And so every one of those leaders serves you. And in our church, we have this equality, this laity, the, the people that aren't necessarily ordained, you might call clergy and laity, and there's this equal representation that is so important in the life of the Free Methodist Church. Because we believe that those who aren't ordained still have authority over those who are. It's a, it's a mutual accountability, a mutual submission. And yes, some people have been set apart for service to the Lord. Clergy, they've taken ordination vows. They're accountable in different kinds of ways. But we share that leadership responsibility. And why am I saying all of that about the leadership? Because I want you to understand that as you look at me as your pastor... As you look at our broader Free Methodist Church and our structure, sometimes it's easy to say, oh, it's up to him. Oh, he's the pastor. He'll take care of it. He'll do And I'm telling you, I need you. I can't do it alone. And we have a leadership team here at the church. We call it our administrative council. And then we have uh, ministry team leaders as well. And, and we work as hard as we can to facilitate the different ministries that we're trying to accomplish. But they cannot be done without you. They're not just happening on their own. We are a shared collective group of gifted people. And so we may be set apart in some ways to help organize and coordinate and put it all together, but all of it is necessary. You are all so essential and so necessary. And all of those gifts work when they're in mutual submission to one another. I need you. You need me. The gifts that we have must be in submission to each other. Amen? Amen? We're building the church together. Jesus Christ, I, I take that back. Let me stop, back up. Jesus Christ is building his church through us Amen. together. Amen? Amen? Much better statement. I'm not building it, you're not, but Jesus Christ is building his church, but he's using us to do it, and he uses us to do it collectively. So let's just think about this for today. What are some things that you could take away from these thoughts today? And again, this is not a deep dive on what spiritual gifts are, but this is making the case that spiritual gifts are essential to the life of our church. Number one, you should study more about what spiritual gifts look like. If you've been through a membership class here at New Hope, one of the goals that we've always tried to do is to get you to take a spiritual gifts inventory. And they are free online. You can take those spiritual gifts inventory. You can learn a lot about yourself. If you don't know, if I've talked to you and I've laid out these five offices and there are others out there, if I've shared these and you're like, I don't know what my spiritual gift is, start there. You can discern it. And if you don't know where to start, please write it down on that paper that I showed you at the beginning. Tell me. I need to know more about these spiritual gifts and I will point you in the right direction. Second is explore. Once you know your gifts, where are they needed? 
Look around the life of our church. Look at who we are. Look at what we do. Where are your gifts needed? And do not hesitate to share, I have this gift. How can I use it in the life of our church? There are some times I'll say, you know what, we're not there yet. I don't know exactly. We don't have an exact fit for that, but maybe there's something else in the, the broader life of the church where that gift is necessary. We're a connected denomination. There are many churches, many different opportunities in the life of the Free Methodist Church. So whether it's local or whether it's a part of our broader Free Methodist Church, there may be lots of opportunities. Or that gift should be put to work in the world around you. Where are you serving? Where do you live? Where do you work? All those sorts of things. Is your gift being employed where you are? Where are your gifts needed? And then discern, and this is one of the questions I'll ask you in a minute, what's missing in our church? What do you see as you look around the life of our church in terms of the gifts that were listed or the gifts that you know about in those other passages of Scripture? What gifts are missing in the life of our church? Because we need them all. In order to grow and to become healthy, we need all of our gifts to be present and at work. And if you aren't seeing something, I'd like to see it through your eyes. Because I'm trying to be in tune, but I might be missing something too. So what do you see that's missing? And then prepare. As people use their gifts, this goes back to what I said earlier, it might get a little messy. It might get a little messy. Spiritual gifts get a little messy. There's a lot of pitfalls, right? They can be abused. You have some examples of how spiritual gifts might have been abused in your own experience. But we have an authority structure, an accountability structure. We have pastors and leadership teams that come together to help hold those things in check and hold them in accountability. But be prepared to give and take a little bit because you might be hearing some things, you might be seeing some things that make you uncomfortable, but they're necessary. They're necessary to push us out of our comfort zones sometimes. And yes, we have to be cautious so we will be wise, but be prepared to be patient with one another and then use your gifts use those gifts in the world around you this is one of those disciplines where it's important to understand how it influences the life of a church but it's also important to understand that this these gifts they're meant also for the world they're meant to be moved out into those what we would call half circles and dotted circles of our lives where we engage and interact with culture some of those places that we interact with culture we invite them to our space And some of those places we interact with culture, we're going into their space. But in regardless, our gift is meant for all of those places. And some of you have multiple gifts, and you can be using those multiple gifts in multiple places. It's not just for the church, but the purpose is to build the church for works, to to do good works for Jesus Christ. Amen? You with me? Is all good? Uh, By show of hands, just really quickly, how many of you would say you know your spiritual gift? Okay? There's a lot of you that aren't raising your hands, so you're going to start right with the first one. All right? And that's a great place to start. There is nothing wrong with that. But don't be ashamed. Don't be shy. Don't don't wonder. You, You need to figure it out because you are important to the life of this church. And if you're not even... A Christian yet, if you're kind of new to this whole faith idea, you might have to back up even a step further and say, is this something that I really want to get into, right? Because we don't start with spiritual gifts. We start with giving our lives to Jesus Christ. We start by becoming a part of and proclaiming the good news of his gospel and saying, I want to be a part of that. Can you allow me, Jesus Christ, into that process? I invite you into my heart and I want to be a part of that. So you might even take one step further back from studying and accept who Jesus Christ is. And that's really where those cards come in. So everybody hold up your card again. Please hold your card up, everybody. You know why I ask everybody to hold your card up? Because some of you, you know this drill, but there are some who are here for the first time, and if they don't see you doing this, they're going to feel really out of place, right? They're going to be, oh, I'm new, I'm filling out a card. No, everybody, take a card out, fill it out. These are the questions I'd love for you to answer on your card this morning. What gifts are visible in our church? What gifts are lacking in our church? And what are your spiritual gifts? I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward, and they're going to just play for a couple of minutes, and they're just going to give us some space, some space to answer those questions. Yeah, I know. Where'd they go? We need those questions back. 
So they'll bring those questions back up here in just a minute. Um, basically, what, are, what, are, what gifts are in our church? What gifts are lacking in our church? And what are your spiritual gifts? All right? Okay, has everybody got these questions? <laughs> Summarized. Visible, lacking, and what are yours? All right? There's the, there's the list if you want to use that. You can also turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You can also turn to 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans chapter 12. Um, and you can dig in a little bit deeper. But just take a few minutes. And then at the end of our service, the very end of our service, I'll come back in a minute, but at the very end of our service, you'll have a chance to give those cards in a basket at the back of the, the sanctuary on your way out. And uh, I'll collect all of that and we'll review that and, uh, and be prayerful about that. Let's just uh, spend a few minutes studying.